kick it. Kick it real good. Yes, 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 yes. No! Just kidding, yes. Welcome back to Sonic Weekly, the once every seven days or so program about Sonic the Hedgehog and various associated interests and so on. I am Grant, one of your hosts. Bo is back with us this week. Hi, Bo. Hey, yes, I am in for Smoothies, who is out on special assignment. Here we go, buddy. Saluting you, Smoothies, out there. Maybe you're listening, maybe you're not. And here he is, out of the shadows, into the spotlight, the star of the show. It's David the Lurker. Hi, David. Oh, hi, Grant. Hi, Bo. Hello. Yes, welcome. Wow. Good Good time. Uh, yeah, I think, what is what is the assignment this movie's on? I think he went to class, and mm-hmm. he has to write a seven-page, double-spaced paper on Easy. the history of macromedia fusion did you guys ever like write <laughs> essays about the sega dreamcast or whatever in school it's like eh, I, I know this <laughs> oh yeah All i may time. have written a couple essays about shenmu symbolism <laughs> therein yeah yeah i did back to the future for sure and i did i'm sure i did a sega one i wrote a sega art i wrote a sega dreamcast uh ode to the sega dreamcast for vice Remember Vice, vice Vice.com? Oh. uh, I was just like, oh, the Sega Dreamcast, what a wonderful console you were. But it was just like saying the usual things that you would say in any article about the Dreamcast of like, yeah, Shenmue, Crazy Taxi, Seaman, Sonic Adventure, bada bing, bada boom. Uh, And a little bit of whining about the current state of video games in there as well, which, you know, we can do. Um, But before we get to the news and before we talk about the state of video games and all sorts of video games, let's introduce... Our guest this week, he's a animator. Uh, he's a friend. We met each other during the the lockdown pandemic over uh, 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 an unnamed chat app. Unnamed because I can't think of it. <laughs> also unnamed because I don't want to give them the shout out now that I can't think of it. Uh, Seth Anderholm. Hi, Seth. Hi. I'm glad to be here. How's it going, everyone? Good. Yeah. <laughs> We've never, at, we, we, sorry, we stumbled over that because nobody's ever asked us how we are before. We, we don't, it's a foreign concept. We're just, we're, we're good. <laughs> right. I good, can't think I of any guest who's been like, oh yeah, how are you? It's always like, oh yeah, thanks for having me. I'm doing good. Yeah. And then they like do a magic trick and it's, it's nice to be asked. Yeah. Uh, I didn't prepare any magic tricks, but you Uh-oh. know, just that hospitality on my end, you know, it's Uh-oh. my goal. Did, did you ever try to learn magic? Um, I know. If, okay. I do know a few tricks. I do know, like, you know, you'll pull them out to the kids at a party or whatever and be like the cool uncle, but you know, then you run out of like the three of them. And- <laughs> well, what are we talking here? Is it like never ending tissue? Is it like, uh, like how to shoot a quarter from the back of your head out of your mouth or to make it look like that to kids, you know? Okay. I'm impressed. Uh, not to give away all my secrets, but you just put it in the elbow and then flick it out later. <laughs> Don't spoil the magic. Uh, Seth, you're you're not just a cool uncle. You're a cool guy. Uh, can you uh, w- list some of the projects that you've worked on? Um, as a, I think you work in, as a storyboard artist. Is that yes. am I right? Yes. So I'm a storyboard artist. I'm an animator. I've worked on indie projects. I work for places like Warner Brothers, uh, Titmouse. I'm currently doing some gigs with a studio called Animasia. Um, I've worked on a project that has had Jaleel White voice the main character. It's, hey. uh, it was originally Adventures called Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> no, it's not Sonic, unfortunately. Sonic, Sonic it's Adventure. his other, <laughs> it's his, it's his other big IP. Uh, it was called, Urkel. did I do that? To, yeah. Did I do that oh. to the holidays? Uh, Steve Urkel story. You oh. worked <laughs> on the Christmas cartoon that, yeah. I don't think that came out, right? It came or, out. It came oh, out. It did finally it come, come out. Wow. It did come out. It came out the Christmas afterward. Oh, okay. That's why I, I guess I missed it. But I, cause yeah. I remember it was like, Oh, here it is. It's coming back. And then it just vanished. And that was yeah. at a time when everything vanished. So I guess it yeah. finally coming out completely yeah. missed it. I missed it too. And I was, I was curious. I was curious. So maybe Seth, you can answer, uh, because I know that family matters ends on Steve Urkel going to space right. and coming back from outer space mm-hmm. and right. kissing Laura on the lips and saying, um, this is out of the world. This is out of the this world. He's, he yeah. stutters too. And, <laughs> and they close the whole series on that. Right? Uh, does does the new special 
um, you know, deal with the aftermath of this expedition or does it, is it non-canonical? It absolutely it like- does not do anything with any other cast member of Family Matters. It's just Urkel, whole, whole new cartoon cast. That's right, because there's there's a difference of ownership, I think, right? He owns the character Urkel. And then Wait, did he owns. negotiate that? That's amazing. I don't know if that's true. That might just be an urban legend, like a myth. Right. I don't know right. if that's actually um, right. I mean, he he uh, he has a lot of say on the character. Um, like, I mean, if you want Jaleel White to voice it, he's for him. That's like his that's his character that built him, you know, uh, you know, mm-hmm. second only to Sonic, of course. Right. Um, <laughs> but he he had like a lot of notes that were good. Like they were just like, yeah, uh, Urkel would not screw up this basketball shot. <laughs> Urkel would nail this basketball shot. He's really good at basketball. There's a whole episode on that. You know, like stuff like that. Fun. Um, yeah. And he was, yeah. from my perspective, I didn't work with him directly, but from my perspective, he was totally easy to work with. He was like humble. He's like, you know, always allowing for like other people to do what they need to do to make the show better. Like whether it's messing with his voice or whatnot, you know? Right. I, I would That's assume awesome. he, he must have some degree of control as to like, Oh, he can use Urkel whenever right. because he did resurrect the character to sell the purple Urkel strain. That's of what weed. I was thinking. Yeah. He yeah. Oh, he did. He must yes. have bought. And he, okay. because he comes back, it's live action. I think, is it him and Snoop Dogg? But he's like in character <laughs> within the glasses, very much different than, you know, the, the ABC sitcoms of the time where it was all, Oh, no one's allowed to do drugs. No one's allowed to have, premarital yeah. sex nobody's allowed to do yeah. these things and now oracle's like yeah i you know i don't want to actually do the voice but he's like yeah i can smoke i'm smoking with snoop dog please buy my weed um, <laughs> i think i saw that yeah no i, it, I it, remember there's a lot of urkel. this there's a yeah, yeah i missed it i mean i knew about the purple urkel strain mm-hmm. and I, I and i think i remember anyway there's urkel <laughs> lore to catch up on there's also sonic news not too much sonic news but seth we usually do cover the sonic news of the week on the show, uh, and it, it, David, I'll I'll connect us to the the, the main news this week. Yes. Aside from the fact that there's no movie three trailer, which we'll talk about, <laughs> that is the is big that one. there. It was announced that there's going to be a new animation starring Shadow, and that Maria Robotnik is going to have a new voice actor who is somebody that is famous, but who I don't remember off the top of my head, and oh. I don't have it up. Yeah. And anyway, it's coming out at the Anime Expo. Um, along with the overall panel about yes. Shadow. Yes. Uh, this week. Stephanie, I actually, I'm not sure you pronounce her last name. I might just be Sha. It's S-H-E-H. Uh, she's been in a few things. Hey, uh, she was Sailor Moon and Sailor Moon Crystal. Uh, Bleach was, yeah, I don't watch a lot of anime, so I'm like, Bleach, yeah. Aura, Hime, in, no. Uh, We're the uh, wrong people to talk yeah, about this. Yeah. The point is uh, that- Hinata from Naruto. Everyone watched Naruto and uh, a character in uh, Fully Cooly, FLCL. Oh, <laughs> Ma- which one? Uh, Mamimi Samajima. Sa- Samajima. Sa- Samajima, Mimi. yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I watched the first episode of that and went, oh, I should watch the rest and never did. And that was like yeah. 15 years ago. <laughs> I'm very okay. bad at watching this, anime. This is an experienced voice actor. Yes, this yeah. is so. Uh, she's been around. She's been in a lot of things, and now she's going to be Maria, who hasn't right. had a voice since Shadow the Hedgehog the game in 2005. Right. I guess partly because she died. She got shot. Now, Maria, not the voice <laughs> actor of Maria. Yeah. This this leads one to assume that mm-hmm. they're probably going to give Maria more lines in this animation, which is also called dark beginnings there's a lot of fonts on the poster that announced <laughs> yes. this but sonic x shadow generations dark beginnings is the animation for sonic x shadow generations which... are we saying the x i feel like no the whole thing but i'm saying to say Son- yeah sonic shadow. i say the x right. Right. Yeah. the yeah. x is barely part of the logo it looks like it's just the back stuff coming in through bleeding through by mistake if it was a comma, I wouldn't say it. But if it's if it was an ampersand, I would say and. But it's an X, and I get, I mean I get it. X is the new ampersand. That's the cross. Ampersand is the new and. Do you yes. say cross? Sonic cross shadow. 
Sonic Slash Shadow? Well, That's a whole other ooh. thing. <laughs> yeah. Sonic Semicolon Shadow. Oh. That, yes, that's what we need to get to. We need yeah. to bring back semicolons, especially in titles. I don't know how many <laughs> things have a semicolon in the title. Programmers, it, they, they got those on lock. Find it easy in the search bar. Just put the semicolon. You get the Sonic show. <laughs> I was going to say, if there's any one thing I've learned uh, in mass from listening to this podcast, like the last few episodes, is the bloodlust that Sonic fans seem to have for this, like, Absolutely. little girl. They want to see <laughs> yeah. the body hit the floor. Yeah. Right. It, it, I think it's, be, it's yeah. the excitement of, like, you know, Shadow or uh, Sonic Adventure 2 comes out. Like, if you were a kid, now you're a teen. And maybe you want Sonic to grow up with you. So it's like, wow, this story seems dark and dramatic. And there's a character who dies. And so because the franchise has gone through so many different phases and, and sometimes it's more sanitized uh, than others, the idea of like hey, they might actually explore the story and explore a character dying instead of them just vanishing or being transported to a different dimension or something. It, it's it's I guess it's the excitement of treating the source material properly or well or whatever. So. And, I, and and of course, you know, surely all the fans want it to be handled graciously right. and, and tastefully and, and with the gravitas that such a event would. They definitely don't presumably want a, a new grounds video. Shh, 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 hey, Maria, <laughs> what? Turn around. No, I can't remember this. And it's just See, the most what I graphic. Want, what I want is like just a series of near misses for her where she like. <laughs> Walks under a ladder and then like narrowly <laughs> escapes and then like almost falls. They shoot the two. outline around. Yeah, it. right. Well, just keep yeah. subverting it. The worst possible take you could do with it is like it's a story that's all focused on the guy who shoots her. What's his backstory? <laughs> what's what's his deal? And it just sort of they follows totally, him. I mean, they totally did do that, right? I can't remember which anime series it was. It X, uh, where. Yeah. There's like it's like the guy giving his perspective, like he's the one who says what happened, like the one who shot her and how like guilty he feels over it. Yeah, yeah, that is uh, for anyone who always is like, oh, Sonic X, you know, some people love it, some people hate it. But I feel like even the people who hate it always bring that up is like, this is something interesting and good they did. And then immediately go back to bashing on Chris. Uh, (laughs) But yeah, I mean, why center the show around anyone other than sonic like that's always my big complaint in the sonic media is that uh it always feels like they need to pull sonic out of the most interesting like aspect of it which is like the world and then put him in the human world with a human protagonist who is always generic you know right it's done it a few yeah they've uh, yeah, they yeah a number of times they they seem to like that trope. Seth, uh, maybe now is a good time to ask you what's your history with uh, Sonic the Blue Savior? Uh, how did you first encounter this devilishly charming hedgehog? And uh, I because you, you seem to know your Sonic stuff. Uh, you know, you're I referencing... I have definitely prepared a little bit for this for this podcast. I kind of took a trip down nostalgia lane. Because like my start is definitely destroying a um, blockbuster rental video, rewinding it over and over again of the OVA from back in like 1996, Amazing. the Perot one. Yeah. Uh, and Child Me was just absolutely enamored in like this world and these characters and sassiness. I didn't, I didn't know what English voice actors were supposed to sound like, so I was like, yes, this checks. <laughs> Uh, I remember just seeing those first scenes and seeing like like Sonic in that destroyed plane, hanging out with Tails, and wanting to see more of that, and then yeah. also enjoying watching the rest as they go into the land of darkness, as they fight Metal Robotnik, Metal Sonic, as Tails shows up in like a really badass hat that I never got in the games. Oh, Knuckles, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, not mm-hmm. not not yeah, no, Knuckles, not Tails. And so that was just definitely a like like, I don't know, big thing for me. And I played video games and whatnot, but it was never that, you know, or at least what that did for my imagination as a kid, you know? Yeah. OVA is top tier. Uh, As far as the games go, are there any that like you have spent much time with or um, has it been more through like other media like Sonic X and, and the OVA? By a large margin, it's definitely the shows, but 
I did have the Game Boy Advance games. I did play those a lot. And I, those are some of the first games that like I beat that I can mm-hmm. remember like mm-hmm. beating. Um, and uh, of course, like Smash Bros. Yeah. As well as like the I have a lot of a lot of really fond memories of a game that was out around the same time, which was the Mario X Sonic Olympics games. Those were just great. Uh, I believe that was the Mario ampersand sign uh, <laughs> Olympic Art. games. Semicolon, ah, the games yeah, that are uh, played. <laughs> pretty sure it was a semicolon. We can call it a semicolon. Yeah. 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 It might have been an M dash, you know. I'm not really oh. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was definitely shows. I watched the heck out of Sonic X. I, again, destroyed a blockbuster uh, videotape rewinding that thing too much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, were they, uh, were they mad about that? Um, child me didn't have to deal with it. So <laughs> yeah. no. <laughs> right. Yeah. That problem just, you know, evaporated. Um, clearly you should have gotten the DVD version. Uh, <laughs> it wouldn't have broken on you. <laughs> A five-year-old in 1999, you know, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. <laughs> just watching the, just watching the filament melt. Wow. That's fun. Yeah, no, it and it's and it's. I rewatched it uh, earlier today uh, in preparation for this interview or for this podcast, and I was just still blown away by some of the visuals. Like now that I know what they're doing, now that I know like some of the techniques they were doing, there was just some masterful craftsmanship in that movie. There would obviously be times where it would cut away, and all of a sudden it would it would cut back, and they would say what's happened to them, you know, which is kind of like a storyboard sin almost you know but there were times where especially like in the opening sequence where uh old man owl is like flying towards that wall and you see the ocean doing like seven frames you see the wall panning you see them flying doing three frames tails just jabbing the peace sign in his <laughs> face for some reason but uh. Now, this is an interesting perspective because like sometimes we talk to people who are in animation and they say, oh, I can't really watch animation because I can only see the budget or it just reminds me of work. But you still appreciate it. You still like it. I'm crazy. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I do this in my free time still. Like I, I don't. I don't think it's healthy, but I do it. <laughs> my wife makes me stop a lot and I appreciate her for it. And I, I go, Oh, if, if Lada's telling me to stop, I, I should, I should stop. <laughs> like I should take a break now and I'll sit there. And I'll still be thinking of animation for 30 minutes before it finally gets out of my brain. You know, this is off script, but I saw people talking about this a couple of weeks ago and I'm curious about your, your perspective. Grant, granted, David, you, you can chime in here too, but <laughs> I, why is like post nineties American animation like stylistically ugly? So like the Rugrats, Ren and Stimpy, Ed, Ed and Eddie, like it's not just cheap. It's like, we're going to make this look like hairy and gritty and kind of dirty. I think, I think it's I, there. I mean, there's always a couple of answers, right? There's there. It's hard to like capture an entire movement, but this is a point in which you see, um, like in the nineties, especially is a point where you see like animation studios take off television wise. And then you see a bunch of like big animation studios make a comeback, right? Like your Disney's are making like beautiful Lion King, Little Mermaid, uh, like what's called like the golden age, essentially. Um, Whereas uh, like you start to see television shows kind of do like the opposite of that, right? Like, like Ren and Stimpy uh, was made by John Kay, who's for her. A lot of reasons, very canceled right now, and <laughs> justly so. But he's a smart dude. Like he 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 knew his audience. He knew his like like that there was a taste for something that was ugly, but there was a taste for something that was designed in a different way. Whereas Disney always went for these like big eye, like appealing, pretty designs. He kind of zagged when everyone was zigging, and was like, "No, we're going to design and push the exaggeration of these poses." and completely different ways uh i think another thing is like when you make something ugly it's a lot more relatable in a way like i think big eyes makes things relatable to you in that like oh you can look at those eyes and you can make a connection right eyes are the pathway to the soul uh but when something's ugly like rugrats and you're a baby and you're ugly and you look in the mirror and you're like oh yeah that's me <laughs> like like i'm tommy pickles I, I i i can i can run with this you know <laughs> 
Well, yeah. this, this is a great answer, and I'm I'm glad none of you were like, "What are you talking about? These shows look great, look beautiful." <laughs> <laughs> well, you're talking about stylistically ugly. Like, yes, things yes, can yes. be appealing but ugly. Like Ren and Stimpy is very appealing. Like the designs are appealing. It's but the characters do look objectively ugly. You wouldn't want to marry any of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My brain just goes to like, okay, now the conversation is about which cartoon characters do we want to marry? Okay, David, you're up first. And, and oh, you can't say much. Dibs on Daria. Since, I think Daria's in high school, Bo. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she's graduated since then. <laughs> right. At the time, I was, uh, I was in elementary school. <laughs> yeah. Right. How does time uh, go through? Yeah. Well, you know what? Like, if, if we're rewinding and, and trying to figure out, I feel like the, the first cartoon crush would have had to have been april o'neill from the ninja turtles yeah she's yeah. A, yeah, that's a good one right she's a professional you know she has a, a job her own apartment she knows what she wants and she spends a lot of time in the sewers but what else <laughs> would you want <laughs> <laughs> Out of yeah. A, yeah um catwoman from batman the animated series oh uh, yeah uh okay yep. so let's pretend I never asked that question and never talk about it again. Uh, okay. You know what else happened this week was, did I say this already? Movie three trailer. It did not happen. Did, it not, did not come out. There was a lot of anticipation on Twitter, uh, sometimes known as X.com, that thing that used to embed easily into any chat right. program you were using and now doesn't without hacking. Uh, well, I think it's interesting that they went from, no, it won't work at all to, hey, it's a dice roll. Today it might work. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, it's uh, oh, man. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a Russian roulette. Do you feel it? Do you feel lucky, punk? <laughs> I, I feel so unlucky because like every time I finally start to make progress on a social media platform, something happens to it. Like first it was Twitter. I had built my entire following on Twitter, and now it's died on me. So I moved to TikTok, and I finally started to get the hang of TikTok, and I'm finally learning how to move the things uh it's, it's illegal now it's gonna it's gonna <laughs> something's well, gonna happen to it soon we'll, right. we'll see what happens yeah. there we'll see what happens but you know yeah well, you could um I, myspace still exists right uh <laughs> yeah there we go i mean it's 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 back to instagram but instagram has the problem of being like the master what what was it like master of none but uh like jack, of all, it, trades. jack of all trades yeah. but master of none right, right. where yeah it tries to do everything everyone else is doing but it's kind of fundamentally broken as a result of that and it doesn't really you can't really navigate it as much Facebook. as you can yeah right yeah, yeah jack, meta. <sighs> jack of all trades was also a short-lived syndicated series starring bruce campbell of evil dead fame <laughs> Mm. It was partnered wow. with the show Cleopatra 2525. I remember Cleopatra 2525. <laughs> we all remember Cleopatra 2525. Was that yeah, the recent times. animation one? That one like no. a couple of words? Uh, I did, if there was a Cleopatra 2525 a... revival, this is news to me. This was a uh, Pamela... No, that was, no, that VIP. was VIP. Yeah, <laughs> Cleopatra 2525 is a weird sci-fi show about a... Oh, a lady who gets frozen in modern day and wakes up in the year 2525 and has to fight a something. I, I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> it's ladies and they're doing uh, fighting things. Uh, right. Are you thinking about okay. Totally Spies? Because the, they just re resurrect Totally Spies. The no, no, season. this was like back during COVID. There was like a Cleopatra sci-fi animated show and like it didn't oh. gain much it didn't gain much attention. But there were like in like animation circles, like awards, like given to like the board artists because like they did a really good job. Right. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't know. Cle the Cleopatra 2525 has nothing to do with Cleopatra, the historical figure. I don't think it I has don't very remember. little to do with the year 2525 either. Right. It has very little to do with Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> Yes, let's move on from all of the several last topics that we were on. Yes, no, no movie. movie trailer yet. There were people who were thinking it's going to be attached to If. There were reports that, hey, the movie or the trailer is locked and loaded in theaters. It's coming. It's got to be coming. What's Paramount releasing? They're releasing If. Maybe it'll be there. And uh, no, apparently the answer Turns is no. If not. If not. Not. So so, so now the, the next theory is maybe Garfield. And if it's not Garfield, then maybe it'll be Summer Games Fest. And if it's not that, then maybe Paramount has decided not to release the movie. 
Oh, they changed their mind. <laughs> it's got to be Garfield. It's one hundo got to be Garfield. Right. Got to be Garfield. Sonic yeah. and Garfield have teamed up in the past. That's the right. PC release of the Sonic and Garfield video games for the Sega Genesis, and uh, Sonic and Garfield. You know, they both have attitude. Uh, <laughs> Does Garfield have attitude? They, they both like heavy yeah. foods. Uh, Heavy Italian, uh, chili dog's not Italian, but you could make no. it Italian. You could if you, you could put it in a lasagna if you want. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you both have weird feet. <laughs> back in um, back uh, when the Turkish earthquake happened, uh, I ran a charity stream where uh, one of the options you could donate to the stream, like if you donate a hundred dollars, everyone, every artist on the stream would come together to make a comic. Uh, based off of the user's request, and we got a request to bring Sonic and Garfield on a date. Wow! Uh, yeah, yeah. So, do, do they fall I'm, in love? Uh, yeah, they do. In fact, fall in love. Uh, do I drop this comic in the chat? Is this something that would? This would probably be terrible. Legally, for you have to. Yeah, you, you can show it to us. We'll describe it. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. So, so for the viewers at home, we we like to challenge the audio. <laughs> Where, where you know some people on youtube do uh comic dubs so this doesn't have dialogue though so we see a first panel sonic is he's on a curb we got to close up his foot it's tapping it's classic sonic tapping but it's not classic sonic he's wearing a jacket sonic doesn't wear clothes but he does here in this au where garfield rushes up i guess is apologizing for being late he's a cat or, you know Oh, it looks fine. There they are. They're sitting at a table. Oh, Garfield put his hand on Sonic's hand and, and then they're acting all bashful. And then, whoa, look, the, the eyes meet and their cheeks are blushing and, and there's a little candle. OK, yeah, I see it. They fall in love. Sonic and Garfield, they've been <laughs> caught in the act, as it were. Uh, well yeah. done. Well done. Let's make that last panel the uh, cover of the podcast episode. <laughs> if you were wondering why this episode has a weird cover, that's why. It took you <laughs> this long into the podcast to get the reference, but now you understand it, right. and we can move forward. We can move forward. It's stuck through. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What else is there to talk about? Well, we are here ostensibly, as, the, uh, as you also know, dear listener, uh, to talk about Super Smash Brothers. Uh, yes. The Supreme Smash Brotherings. Uh, this is uh, a game that Seth is much better at than I am. Uh, I always play a Sonic. I, I think I'm pretty good at Sonic. I can sometimes be an elite. This is in Smash Ultimate. You routine, yeah. routinely body me as Jig- Jigglypuff. Uh, yes. Jigglypuff rocks my shit, and I cannot get a, 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 a any sort of... It's not even close, really. Um, Smash Brothers. You got me. You almost got me once. I've got, I've got <laughs> you a couple times. I've kept close track of it. Uh, Sonic <laughs> first appeared in in Brawl. That was uh, that was that was huge for Sonic. Yeah. Huge for Smash. Um, and you know, uh, but yeah, uh, maybe you could just tell us first how you similar how you got into Smash and uh, and then yeah, then we could talk also about like where were you. I, where where fucking were you when Sonic was announced for Smash? Whether you're into Smash or not, I feel like that was such a seismic IGN news article <laughs> that it did right. shake the world for a day. Right. Uh, I mean, where I was was uh, definitely I was at this this uh, place you would go to, like teenagers would go to, or like I was like 11, 12, or if, if even then. Oh yeah, it would have been like twelve or thirteen. There was like a place teenagers would go to after school or whatever, and they would have a Wii, and we would play there. And I'd be like, "Wait, Sonic's in this game? What? That's cool." But like at the same time, like I didn't understand IP as a kid. I didn't realize that both Sonic and Snake were like the first third party IP ever brought into Smash Bros, and that that was symbolizing and one of many ways a huge departure in the series from melee like moving forward right yep because like for me i i played like smash bros is like smash bros and ocarina of time are my first video games i can't even tell you which one. probably ocarina of time by a margin but i had both games at the same time older brother privileges you know <laughs> um 
And I just loved the game as a kid before I could even be good at it. Um, I played Melee. I put so many hours into Melee as a kid, and I can't even remember. Uh, and then Brawl came out, and I I always progressively thought growing up that the next Smash Bros. game was better than the last, not knowing, you know, like not being able to put into retrospect. Like, I thought Brawl was great when it came out, you know? And now I'm like, oh. Uh, I haven't played it since, uh, like, I, I've never gone backwards in Smash chronology, I don't think. What are the, Yeah, what do the real Smash heads think of the series? Like, what's the best one? What's the worst one? So, so for real Smash heads, first Smash Bros. is cute. Um, it's just not the complete game. The second game, though, Melee, is the one that people still play to this day. Like, people play Melee, like, like it's just done. That was the last one that ever came out. I mean, there, there's obviously there's people who play ultimate, like, which is the newest one. This is the first one that's come out. That's really been considered like viable since melee. Like smash four was also good, but no one had a Wii U in reality. Yeah. Um, but the thing is melee is so great. People love it. Cause it's just unfinished. Like the game devs made a game that was fun for them. And then they're like, okay, let's roll it out. They're like, what? Yeah. We need something <laughs> to come out with, not with the GameCube, but shortly after, I believe it was. Yeah. Like yeah. they needed something to boost sales real quick. And so they just put Melee out essentially unfinished. And I think the reason why people like it is because it's a game made for people who know video games so intimately because they're the ones playing it. Like they're essentially QAing their own stuff at that <laughs> point. They didn't really go through that phase. And yeah. so people love this game because like 20 years later, there's still the roster is changing. Like who's. Who's high tier? Who's low tier? I mean, Bowser's always on bottom, but <laughs> other than that, like, 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 who's high oh, tier? So there's like tier? innovation and in, like play styles, and yes, that's interesting. Yes, in fact, like Jigglypuff was always like rather low tier until a player named Hungrybox came around and just dedicated, dedicated hours and hours and hours upon hours onto Jigglypuff alone. And basically revolutionized essentially was even my own play style, like what everyone who plays Jigglypuff does. Even though I didn't even know who Hungrybox was until I was already like a year into Jigglypuff playing. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Well, it, it's a pretty accessible game too. Like you can pick right. it up and smash buttons and have a fun time, but it's also technical. That's like a hard thing for fighters would... to achieve, right? Like a, a Street Fighter player won't be able to touch a, a master at all. Right. But like, well. A, a, melee is like that too like yeah. melee is kind of hard to pick up it's high skill ceiling high skill ceiling but something like ultimate like or some our brawl right was brawl was a great entry point for a lot of players because it's the floaty mode uh -huh. you you just everything's so slow everything's so floaty everything's so whatnot the meta strategy on pro play just became to time people out like play meta knight or play diddy kong to time meta knight out was like the strategy like pros hated like the competitive scene hated brawl mm. like passionately to this day they still hate it right but then most of my experience like like the only tourneys i've ever played were ultimate like i got super super into it like on a competitive level in ultimate so that's like where most of my experience is with smash bros at least like my professional knowledge and where i think it's a little bit more relevant to sonic because right now one of the top players, if not the top player, is a player named Son Nix, X instead of C. <laughs> and he's just wreaking havoc across the Smash scene with a Sonic. Just all he does is play Sonic, and he's killing it. That's the way you're meant to play it. If Sonic's That's there, awesome. why why touch any other <laughs> character? <laughs> right. That's how I play it. I actually didn't know about this player, Sonix. Uh, yeah. That's, I, I have heard recently, and it annoyed me every time I heard it, that Sonic is high tier in smash ultimate because i was yeah. like oh well that means it's like i'm cheating then i'm like using a high tier character i'm, I'm playing him because he's sonic it doesn't matter what tier he's going to be but if he's high tier it like cheapens my victories i guess uh right but i, I mean I, I would play a i played a sonic in brawl and and that's the one thing that like if sonic were in melee if that like april fools thing were true yeah i would seek out melee and play it more that's that one i've probably played the least right uh of all of them, but obviously it's got a, no. you know, such a, a long shadow. It is, it is the least accessible too, right? 
Mm-hmm. And the thing about Sonic being high tier is that Sonic's, in my opinion, has basically made Sonic high tier. Like when he first started playing, it was during the Wi-Fi era of Smash Bros. So people were like, oh, he's just a Wi-Fi warrior. Oh, he's not that great. And what then he that? gets into. What does that mean, a Wi Fi warrior? <sighs> so, because Smash <laughs> Ultimate is a good game wrapped in a garbage packaging, its Wi Fi yeah. is horrible. Like, that's yeah. one of the biggest complaints people have. Like, a lot of people went to playing Melee online because the, the jailbroken Melees that you can play online have something called rollback, which essentially is like if you have bad internet, you're the one who's going to suffer for it, not the other person. In Smash Ultimate, not only do both parties suffer for bad internet, it gives faster characters higher advantages. So your Sonics, your Zeldas, your um, Sheiks, like even though Sheik's not a higher tier character because Sheik is faster, you know, like bad internet gives them an advantage. Uh, so people were thinking like, oh, this guy's not going to be good once we cut Wi-Fi out. And then he's traveling across seas to win tournaments because he's just that good. Like he's from the Dominican Republic and he'll go to Japan and he'll sweep, you know? I, I love that. I love that aspect of it. I, I wish I were, I mean, that's, I guess like the, when you're playing it and wasting more hours of your life playing video games, you're like, yeah, well maybe this is paying off. Maybe this is actually like a job (laughs) skill that I'm like investing (laughs) in, but I love that there's like a, there's this community around it. And I like, and that's my hope for, we were talking about this off podcast the other uh, day of like, what are they going to do next with Smash? Because Ultimate feels uh, so complete. And right. I like how you were saying that Melee, part of the appeal is that it, it feels unfinished. And that's a really interesting point. And it does feel like the one missing thing with it is just like online that works. If they could get that right for Switch 2, then I don't know that I need another video game again. <laughs> I, think, I think Nintendo is so aware of the double-edged sword of this being a competitive game. Because competitive scenes can be toxic. I mean, Smash Bros. in 2020 took a massive hit with just the amount of toxicity that was coming from that community. Oh, right. Yeah, I forgot Uh, about that. Now I'm remembering. uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, that sucks. That was the worst thing of that year, I thought. (laughs) It it definitely dampered the amount I played Ultimate because I was already trying to play it despite COVID and despite the internet being bad. And none of my friends would play it with me because the internet options were just so bad. Um, There's no proper competitive scene online either. You have to like play normals games to get into elite smash. And it's basically more normals games where you can be subjected to anyone's rule sets. Uh, There's no official tourney set by Nintendo. So you go to different countries. It'll be like, Oh, in America you play best out of three, three stock Japan. You play best out of one, three stock. Like, <laughs> you know, right. like here, my uh, Minecraft Steve's banned. Japan, he's not banned. <laughs> you know. How do you Just, feel about items on or items off? Items off. Like, I, I, okay, so Smash Bros. Ultimately, in my opinion, is a party game. I play it like a fighting game. I like to have fun. I like to be competitive. I like to play with my friends like a competitive game. My only rule sets are competitive rule sets. So I I feel like the game is so fun when you don't play with items and you don't have this like weird thing happen all of a sudden, like an item drops in your hand and you throw it at someone or you get a smash ball out of nowhere. But sometimes you're just playing with friends and it's not about winning and it's about doing crazy, weird, silly stuff. And so I like that it's there. I feel like that's how most people should play the game unless you're again, crazy like me (laughs) i'm i'm with you i I think the game is so much more interesting without items because the characters have enough moves that are all cool and easy to pull off for Mm -hmm. anybody because it's just a couple like the butt it's the same there's no like combos to to remember because it's the same input for every character they do different moves um and that that in and of itself is so compelling that i think the items are kind of a hat on a hat i do like that it's there but I think it should be like maybe a little bit more optional and there should be maybe like a streamlined, like this is the, you know, if you engage with it as a fighter, because here's the thing of it as a party game. If you play Mario Kart as a party game, um, you know, if you finish last, that sucks, but you at least still get to like race the race. But if you get like, it feels bad to lose in Smash Bros. (laughs) in a way that it doesn't feel bad to lose in Mario Kart. 
probably because right. you're getting punched in the face and knocked out and it's like physical violence maybe but it just uh I, I i don't know how much it like i feel like for a party game you kind of almost need everybody to be sort of i don't know that's yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. do you consider it to be more of a fighting game or is it kind of its own separate thing like is it street fighter or virtual fighter or tekken so in the fighting game communities a lot of them do not consider smash bros a fighting game yeah. I mean, I think by definition, Smash Bros. is technically a fighting game. You sure. fight, you lose, there's a winner. Um, I'll, I'll be at, I do see where they're coming at it from. And as far as Nintendo considers it, they consider it a party game, right? They don't, they don't want it to even be considered a fighting game, even not on a non-competitive level. Yeah. Do you like other fighting games? Um, I... Like, the thing is, I, I'm really big into aesthetics. Uh, so if a fighting game looks good to me, awesome. But, like, a lot of the Street Fighter games haven't really looked good to me since Third Strike. Um, the Like, there was an aesthetic and appeal they had back then that I feel like they've lost once they went to 3D. Um, I, I've never been big into Tekken. I've never been big into Soul Calibur. Uh, I'm getting really excited for the... Uh, 2XKO or 2KO, the uh, League of Legends fighting game that's coming out. Another Silent X. Uh, two, amp- two Ampersand or two Semicolon KO. <laughs> uh, but uh, Grant, uh, I think you'll like this, is that they're, bring- they're bringing that kind of simple mechanic, like you don't need to know the combos, you don't need to know the whatnot. It's just the directional plus button. Like you don't need to yeah. know the side side, half circle, Whatever. I think that's such a brilliant innovation from Smash. Like, and also the yes. way, like the way that it's it's structured with like getting knocked out of the arena, and it's more um, yeah. sumo inspired than it is like boxing, I guess. Like that, or you know what I mean? Like it, it just has yeah, platform. It's a platform, sure. Yeah, just a different uh, philosophy to it. But it's and yeah, they do position it as like a this other thing. But I don't yeah. Know. I, to me, it's like it still is a fighting game. It's just a different type of fighting. Like Power Stone is still a fighting game, even though it has like a different perspective and like a different objective. Like to me, that is still a fighting game. It's just it's just different. Yeah, I think like Power Stone and Smash Brothers are in the same natural category, whereas like Smash Brothers and yeah. Virtua Fighter Two are like related right. but not directly. Right. Yeah, yeah. And there's always those Smash copies that fail and burn like the the playstation all-stars yeah oh, yeah if i could if i could refund only one video game of my entire life i feel like it would be that one <laughs> you know like like can you please delete my memory of even playing this at this point i i never played that one i did try multiverses and i tried a little bit of the nickelodeon one and they right they both seemed like sad yeah like, just not quite well but one of them has scarfield uh right that's true uh multi multiverses felt like a little extra salty for me when that came out like i never played it um but i was actually working at warner brothers at the time on a batman ip and i i just remember really feeling like you know it's one thing that i have to deal with ip armageddon in my job but then i have to deal with like IP Armageddon in my fighting games now too, you know. I felt that way too. I was also working. I was working in social media via an agency for DC when Multiverses was coming out, uh, and similarly, just feeling like, well, maybe it's just it has nothing to do with where I was working. It's just Multiverses is coded in a sort of cynicism that yeah. Smash Brothers does not feel like it is. Right. Right. Uh, I mean, Gandalf maybe, and. Yeah and Arya Stark and Batman and Harley Quinn. It just doesn't. Right. I don't know. Well, that, that's because I think it's because with, with Nintendo, it's like, Oh, these are all characters that are from video games. Even though everyone, like I've seen plenty of people say, Oh, they need to throw Goku in there. The fact Ugh. that they've resisted putting in anime characters or characters from other non video game franchises. It's like, yeah, these are all game characters. You've all, seen them play you know be yeah. it oh they're in a racer they're in a fighter they're in a platformer they sit and be sad in an rpg i don't know it's like but they're all kind of in the same thing with multiverses and i mean also it's like all of these ips sort of existed from one company they were all built up right through various uh, game eras 
multiverses is just what does Warner Brothers own or what do they have yeah. access to? Not these all came from the same place. These are all the same type of film or from a, a group. Or it's like, hey, you know, we acquired this three years ago. That was something else. Somebody else owned it. Let's throw it in there. I guess that's that is why it feels more cynical. It's lost its soul. It's it's even the people who are making these things, like the artists, like myself, right? Like we'll do the best job that we can at the time, but like they'll pull us onto these projects, not you know having us make the story or make something cool or interesting or new out of it. But they just want us to make that thing that says, oh, this thing, this IP we own right now is popular, or we need to push this IP to make it more popular now. You know, and it's like, okay, but we have original ideas and stories that could be IP that you can do the same thing with 20 years later from now, you know, but the the executives have no incentive to pursue that. Right. I mean, look at Zaslov, the dude's chop shopping Warner Brothers. He's trying to sell everything as a tax write off. And then now he's unselling things as a tax write off because some of those things he's getting sued for. Right, like the Urkel movie we talked about. He tried selling that off, and then Acme versus Warner thing happened. He's like, "Well, okay, I guess I gotta bring this back." Yeah, and you know, it's it does seem like in entertainment and kind of across the board, but certainly in entertainment, a lot of um, executives kind of like cashing out, like just wanting right. the, the short term, next quarter yeah. thing above anything else. Microsoft, uh, Xbox, uh, this week and the last couple weeks is because they've been shutting down studios, which is the thing that everybody called when they were gobbling up studios, buying and acquiring them. Everyone's like, oh, well, we know how this story goes. You're just going to shut them down and then complain that you have no games. And that's exactly what has happened. They are complaining that they have no games while shutting down the studios that were making some of their games. And Sony PlayStation, they've already said earlier this year that there's no more additional first-party PlayStation games to expect for this year because AAA games are just so expensive and so resource heavy that it just is not possible for them to go any faster than the pace that they're currently on. So they're kind of like both imploding under their own weight. Whereas Nintendo has, by virtue of being on its own sort of uh, track, uh, you know, is is consistently you know releasing a game a month. But I think the thing too is that. Smash Brothers uh, is, you know, part of a little bit part of like that games as a platform thing, like a Fortnite, where maybe people are playing fewer games but longer. Yeah. Also, I can't remember if I said all of that earlier on the podcast or just before the <laughs> just show. Before we hit record, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Sometimes that happens where it's like we talk before the show and I was like, oh shit, we should. And then it's like, I got to repeat that, but it's going to give me deja vu. And that's what happened. Right. Yeah. I, I, I wish that we had never left 1998 in a lot of ways, <laughs> not in some ways, but in a lot of ways. And like in those days you could sell a two hour game that had some replay value yeah. and everybody was happy about it. Right. Well, I, f- I feel like it was also easier to be like, well, if I don't buy it, I can just rent it safe from blockbuster sure. video. And so it didn't feel like as, as big of an in- investment. I, I know things like, game pass exist although you can argue oh is that helping or not but it it, it it's like if you yeah, want a game unclear. right unclear. it's like i don't know where you go to rent games anymore um uh, maybe you're the red box that's sitting outside places <laughs> and uh yeah but like if, you're, if all your gaming is digital you're you're kind of put in a place where either you subscribe to a service you pay for every month or you just buy the game no nobody just yeah, goes and rents a game for three bucks and takes it back over the weekend. Search for Steam sales or whatever. Yeah. yeah, so then you just start acquiring as many things as you can in a list, and maybe you'll get to it. it. It just, yeah, I think gaming was just because it was all really physical. I mean, I know there was shareware and PC gaming, and I know that's, right. a, that's a whole other thing, but it still was like if if the if the the big kids on the block are Nintendo and Sega and Sony, like you, you got to go just pick up the game. And I think renting was just a, a good way to experience a two hour game. Somebody paid for it. It's sitting on a shelf. Um, yeah. You know, you're right. There's things that get lost. It was also, time. it was also a great third place 
you know, you could run into your neighbors at Blockbuster. Right. You know, yeah. You could hear what the person at the front desk thought of that game. Right. You know, or, oh, if you like that, go check this one out. Or, you know, the human interactions are something that are just very much getting edged out, you know? <laughs> Who needs to interact with people? You know, it's, it's all messy. Like, what if it's hot out? You're sweating. You can talk <laughs> to somebody while you're sweating. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, if I'm if I'm sweating, don't just pretend I don't exist because that's what I'm doing. Please. <laughs> right. Eventually, you'll you'll turn into a puddle, uh, just like the character from the Secret World of Alex Mack. Uh, and you'll be able Ooh, to. Boy, to can sneak I change away. my answer on which character <laughs> I would marry? <laughs> <laughs> Alex Mack, but because it has to be a cartoon character, that means Alex Mack in puddle form. In puddle I'll, form, I'll right? take in it. Still, yeah, it's like, would you love me if I was a worm? Yes. Would you love me if I was Alex Mack in puddle form? Yes. <laughs> I think Larissa Alanik has played Sonic. Uh, who? Ooh, great oh, question. Yeah, um, I think so. I think I think it's safe to say anyone under the age of 40 has at least played one Sonic <laughs> game. Or at least played it once. Do you think Larissa Olenek has played Sonic 06? <laughs> <laughs> do you think Larissa Olenek has played Sonic in Smash Brothers? I, I do not know who this person is, but I would bet money <laughs> on it that they have uh, played specifically both those games. All right, that uh, that is Alex Mack you were speaking of, right? Yeah. That's that, right, that yes. Name yes. Just to clarify, uh, if anyone doesn't really know, oh, wait, you weren't right. studying those credits, and no, I mean, <laughs> I thought her powers were cool. I was like, I wish I could do all that stuff. I wish I could turn. I would have taken any one of her powers. She like, three I, was, it was a, It was a cool power set that I feel like. Um, what were what was it again? I know it's puddle, and then puddle, lightning fingers, and telekinesis. Telekin, yeah, like I, yeah. I think that's all you really need. Um, plus she had that older sister who was kind of rude and wasn't she also like Judy funny where she was also like an actress or was her other, she was mean for another reason. She wasn't an actress. Maybe she was like good at school. Why was, why was Alex Mack's older sister mean? (laughs) I don't remember. Uh, I think she was kind of like the Donatello though. It was. Oh yeah, she did. She, she, yeah, she she helps her after she finds out about the 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 power, the Uh. power of the ooze, the secret of the ooze. Why didn't they? Yeah, it should have been called Alex Mack semicolon the secret of the news. <laughs> <laughs> could, have, could have all tied in together. Yeah. See, in my turtles, head, I, Garfield, Alex I, Mack, splashing in puddles. No, there's that's no Alex. Alex Mack video game. That's weird. It that seems like there should have been. There was a guts video I mean, game. It's it's in that. I, it's now that I've Googled Alex Mack, <laughs> it's in that it's in that period when you were in that early. Oh, video games are can make a lot of money. Let's all make video games and beat every IP to death before it was even really an IP. There, there was a home improvement 16 bit platformer. Hey, you can get the secret world of Alex Mack uh, from Mill Creek entertainment, the whole series for twenty nine ninety eight. That's a, uh, that's exciting. That's a bad deal. Wow. What a terrible is it? deal. Well, how many discs uh, is that? That's six discs for 30 bucks. Is that good or bad? I mean, if you're getting a tangible set, that's not bad, right? Like if you're getting like a physical. Right. right. Maybe it's a fine deal. Are there bonus features? Tell me there's some uh, bonus features. Commentaries? Please give I don't, me some commentaries. I, don't, I feel like they don't. Well, this is Mill Creek. I feel like they don't do that. Interactive menu? Uh, they probably, they're probably I, the interactive menu. Island camera? Uh, I, I, I didn't uh, I feel like Mill Creek re-released things and sometimes strips out features that existed in previous releases because they can't license it out. Right. So, Mill Creek just sound like somebody who makes cereal, though. <laughs> Mill I Creek. Mean, I'm, why not both? I'm um, thinking General Mills and Kellogg's being from Battle Creek, Michigan. That's where that's see, coming from. Oh, yeah. This is really good Did radio. It, did any of us watch the Pop Tarts movie with Jerry Seinfeld? Uh, is it not. the worst movie of the year? Or I want to preserve my love of the show Seinfeld by not watching it, but by, by yeah, not engaging that's with anything the right Jerry Seinfeld, right? <laughs> yeah. Seth, thank you for joining us this week. Of course. Uh, we have your link to wherever you'd like to point people uh, of any of your social platforms or all of your social platforms. They will be in the description, so you don't need to worry awesome. about reading them out now. Uh, you just need to send them to me. And uh, plug any projects you want, and David will 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 close. Thanks for thanks for joining uh, us, everyone, audience. I mean, I'm the guest. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that. 
You, you know, you were very kind to us in right. the beginning. You're being kind to the audience in the end. This has really been missing from the show. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Thanks, Seth. Everyone's been yeah. rude until today. I was going to say, if anyone wants to find my work, I'm always Sakuga underscore Seth everywhere. I work on my uh, passion project called Oni Girl. It's going to be an indie animated series that I'm making with a very small crew. And we're all going to collect the royalties on it together. So that's my whole new. Hell yeah. And if you want to collect royalties <laughs> on, on something you've been making, perhaps you can do that while listening to another episode of Sonic Weekly. <laughs> wow, that was probably one of my uh, not better uh, transitions there. That's right, Sonic Weekly, the show that you've been listening to for the last hour or so. Hey, if you enjoyed the show and you haven't already, what do you got to do? What you should do, because it helps us and it helps the world somehow, I'm sure, is uh, subscribe to the podcast on your podcatcher of choice, be that Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Podcast Addict, the open source podcast software that we trust, and so should you, because it's open source and everyone loves to be open about their feelings uh, on life and Smash Brothers. That's right. And if you don't feel like messing with any of those podcatchers, because, you know, you didn't play catch growing up, you were like, I'm anti-catch, whatever that means, uh, you can subscribe, of course, to our YouTube, cha- YouTube channel at Sonic-Weekly. Don't forget the at and the dash. And uh, there is footage, uh, gameplay footage there, from our friend of the show, Jack of Old Games. He's the one who puts it together. So you can watch it over there, leave some comments, Maybe we'll read those comments. Maybe we'll read fan mail. We do. We did have some email, but we'll, we'll get to that next week. One of these weeks we will, but, you know, we could we could always use some more. So why don't you uh, send us an email, sonicweeklypodcast at gmail.com. Uh, leave a review. Tell us what you think. Right. That's how you get a hold of us. Right. Uh, you email us. Let us know what's going on. And, of course, you email us if you want to join our Discord server. You ask for that sweet Discord invite link. And then you can join a community of like-minded Sonic the Hedgehog fans, which sometimes don't even talk about Sonic. That's the joy of Discord. There's multiple channels. That's and, you know, right. it's a pretty chill, pretty respectful atmosphere, I would say. Hey, we got to thank. Well, this week, right, we're going to thank Bo for the edit, right? You're editing yep, this one? Smoothies is on assignment. That's right. Smoothies is on assignment. So we're going to thank Smoothies for being on assignment. We're going to thank Bo for the edit. Uh, and I'm going to, of course, got to thank Grant for uh, letting all this happen and uh, kicking, off, kicking it up, kicking it off, kicking it up a notch. Like Grant's doing something with kicks. Thank you, David. <laughs> thank you, David. <laughs>